And it is my great privilege uh, to introduce our keynote speaker. Carol Dweck is one of the foremost scholars on the subject of motivation and has conducted pioneering research on why people succeed or why they don't and how to foster success through growth mindset practices. There's so much we could say about Carol, but I'm gonna keep this short because we all wanna hear from her. Her work has been incredibly influential and has caught fire in the education space, as all of you know. Professor, Professor Dweck is on the faculty at Stanford University, and one of many things that she does every year is she teaches a freshman seminar course, small group of freshmen, on mindsets. She's the author of Mindset, The New Psychology of Success, and we are thrilled to have her today at Leaders to Learn From. Professor Dweck, welcome. Thank you. A few months ago, a colleague sent me a picture of her nephew. He had just turned on a computer for the first time. <laughs> All of our students were once like that. We were once like that. But just a few years later, we're seeing this <laughs> and this. What happened? And how can we give them back their zest for learning? That's what my work is about. That's why I went into this field. And that's why I'm here to talk about the mindsets. In our work, we find that students can have more of a fixed mindset, where they think of their talents and abilities as fixed traits. You have a certain amount, and that's it. Or they can think of their abilities more as something they can develop through their effort, their strategies, and their input from others. They don't necessarily think everyone's the same, but they understand that everyone can get smarter. Now, one of my themes today is it's not either or. We're all a mixture of both mindsets. My talk today will have two parts. One is how and why mindsets matter. And I'll make that short, because I really want to have time to talk with the wonderful Ginny Edwards. But the second half is how to make that journey to a growth mindset more successful for educators and for students. Now, in our work, we've seen over and over that students' mindsets matter. We often assess students' mindsets at the beginning of a challenging transition. Um, we ask them questions like, um, agree or disagree, your intelligence is something basic about you that you can't really change. That's a fixed mindset, and we see if they agree more with that or more with growth mindset items. And then we monitor their performance. Recently, we had the privilege of studying all the 10th grade students in the country of Chile. <laughs> Thank you, Chile. <laughs> and um, so we assessed students' mindsets. And what we found was, I think, truly remarkable. On the left, you have language achievement test scores. On the right, you have math achievement test scores. Across the bottom, you have their income level. And then on the vertical axis, you have their achievement test score. The broken line on top, those are the students who endorsed a growth mindset. And the students on the bottom, with that solid line, a fixed mindset. You can see at every single level of family income the students who held more of a growth mindset substantially outperform the kids who endorse more of a fixed mindset. 
But the most amazing thing was that when a poor student had a growth mindset, they performed at the level of much, 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 much richer students with a fixed mindset. So that was really interesting, how much having a growth mindset boosted the achievement, especially of the low-income kids. Also in many studies, we've been able to teach a growth mindset, either through in-person instruction, where um, in this case, students making the transition to seventh grade, many of them already showing declining grades, were divided into two groups. Half of them, the control group, learned valuable study skills, but the other half learned the skills with a growth mindset. The grow their growth mindset sessions kicked off with this article. You can grow your intelligence. New research shows the brain can be developed like a muscle. They learned that every time they stretched out of their comfort zone to learn something new and hard, and they stuck to it, the neurons in their brain formed new and stronger connections. And over time, they could get smarter. They learned how to apply this to their schoolwork. And when we checked in at the end of the year, we found that the, st the students in the control group, the red line, continued to show declining grades. But the students who learned growth mindset with the study skills showed a sharp rebound in their grades. <clears throat> Since then, we've developed online programs to teach a growth mindset. And in the process, we asked, is it ever too late? So we went around to a bunch of high schools. And in one of the high schools, the administration and the teachers warned us that we were wasting our time. They said, it's too late for these students. Go help younger kids. But we sent out our computer-based growth mindset um, workshop over the internet. Um, we sent it originally to 13 different high schools. And just within a few months, we found a, a jump in grades for the lower achieving kids. In this case, it was the lower third. Since then, we've revised and tested, revised and tested our online workshop. And right now, we've sent it out to thousands and thousands of kids around the country. And in the pilot for that study, we found that not only did we raise the, the grades of more kids, we raised the challenge seeking, the desire for challenge of kids across the achievement spectrum. Isn't that what we want? Don't we want all these kids challenging themselves, eager to learn something hard and new? So we're really excited. And this program we've developed, once we know it's solid, that it reaches a lot of kids, and it affects their motivation and performance, we're just going to release it. And that should be in the next year or two. The battle within us all. So if a growth mindset's so great, why don't we all have it all the time? And the answer is this. There are so many things in the environment that trigger a fixed mindset that make us feel judged. So that when we face a challenge, if we're triggered into a fixed mindset, we think, I better not look dumb. I better not work hard or ask for help. That'll make me feel dumb. And especially if you make mistakes or fail something, get out of there. Turn it off. But if we become able, as students or adults, to stay in that growth mindset, the challenge becomes an opportunity to learn. Working hard, using strategies, getting help, that's how we learn. And when we have difficulty, that's another opportunity to take stock and learn. And once we get kids into that deeply effective, deeply committed learning state, 
those grades and test scores should be a natural byproduct of that. It's all about deep and effective learning. And it's all about creating an environment where students can stay in that growth mindset place and not be triggered into a state of threat and defensiveness, a state of smart and dumb worry. OK, so that's kind of my whirlwind tour. Now the journey to a growth mindset. And I'd like to start with the good old days, some kind of reminiscing. And in the good old days, we used to think it was simple, that the growth mindset was a simple concept. It looks simple, feels simple. You believe abilities can be developed. And we also thought once adults had it, they could easily pass it on to kids. It would kind of naturally show in their practices, and kids would pick that up. We were wrong on both counts. So let's look at this more closely. What is a growth mindset? And what we're finding is that there are common misunderstandings. Many educators think a growth mindset is being open-minded, flexible. You often hear people talk about an open mindset. Well, whatever it is, I'm sure it's a good thing. It's not a growth mindset. <laughs> and when you drift away from that definition, you're not going to do the things that foster a growth mindset. Telling students they can do anything may or may not work, and it may lead them to disappointment if you don't give them the skills and introduce them to the resources to do that. Or most commonly, many educators equate a growth mindset with effort, encouraging students to work hard. And that's what I'm going to focus on. But again, a growth mindset is simply believing that talents and abilities can be developed. So growth mindset's not just about effort. Developing abilities also involves strategies and help support advice and guidance from others. We can't leave those out. And here's why it's important. Think about these reassuring sounding statements. You would have done better if you tried harder. Keep trying and you'll get it. People say these things in the name of a growth mindset. And they sound good, but you would have done better if you tried harder. Maybe, maybe not. If the student didn't have the understanding or the strategies, didn't know where to go next, they can try, but they may not make progress. Or keep trying and you'll get it. Same thing. Maybe they won't get it. And if they don't get it, they'll feel all the more inept. As opposed to asking a student, what strategies have you tried? Let's figure out what your understanding of this is. And let's talk about where you might go next. So probing for understanding rather than saying, try hard. You worked so hard. That's wonderful. Ways in which it may not be so wonderful. Um, many times a parent will say to me, it's not working. I told, I praised my child's effort and it's not working. I said, well, is your child trying hard? No, not really. So <laughs> how's that going to work? How's that working for you? Um, or. Praise the child when they didn't make any progress or they didn't learn anything. And it is fine to praise their, the effort part of it, but effort is not the ultimate value. Learning and progress and improvement are the ultimate values. And effort is one route to learning and improvement. Someone asked me recently, what keeps you up at night? And it's this, it's the fear that my work, which grew up 
to counter the failed self-esteem movement will be used for the same purpose, trying to make kids feel good, but losing sight of learning. The growth mindset is meant to be a tool to help students learn to close achievement gaps, not a way to make kids feel good about not learning. Here's the second part of that journey, changing educators' mindsets. A year or so ago, maybe two years now, a colleague in Australia named Susan Mackey told me she was seeing a lot of what she called false growth mindset. I said, Susan, what are you talking about? It's a simple concept. Why would people have a false growth mindset when they could have a true growth mindset? <laughs> Didn't make sense to me. But she had planted the seed, and then I saw it everywhere. And when I thought about it, I started to understand that educators were kind of seeing that there was a choice. What kind of person am I? Well, there really was no choice, because if you were in a setting that said a, a growth mindset was good and the thing to have, you really didn't have a choice. But people might ask themselves, am I the good growth mindset fairy godmother who develops children's brains and helps them learn? Or, and I see your smiles, <laughs> am I that fixed mindset teacher who poisons their mind and stunts their growth. Well, it's, it's like obvious, right? You're the good person, so you must have, and you have many fine qualities, so you must have a growth mindset. But there's no journey there. You can't just proclaim that you have what you see as the more benevolent view. And now we understand you can't get there without a journey. So what's the first step on that journey? And by the way, we have become so committed to understanding that journey. Um, so what's the first step? You'll be surprised to hear me say this. Let's legitimize that fixed mindset because we all have it somewhere. Acknowledge that we're all a mixture. And then start watching for those fixed mindset triggers. What triggers you into a fixed mindset? Is it when you're confronting a challenge? Do you feel anxious? Maybe you'll be revealed as less competent than you hope. When you're confronting a struggle or a setback or criticism, do you become discouraged, defensive? When you meet someone who is better than you are at something you prize yourself on, do you hate them just a little bit? <laughs> or do you say, wow, how'd they develop those skills? Maybe I can learn from them. When you're in the classroom and you see a student struggling or confused, do you wonder about their ability? Students not listening to your lesson, do you think bad things about them? A student's learning quickly, do you think, oh, that's a smart student? So what are your fixed mindset triggers? We all have them. Get to know them. Get to know your fixed mindset persona. When does it show up? How does it make you feel? How does it affect your behavior, your relationships, the goals that you're trying to pursue? And over time, learn to work with that persona. So I was uh, watching Susan Mackey work with some bank executives in Australia. She had them give their fixed mindset personas names. And this kind of buttoned up suit, who was the head of the unit, was talking about his fixed mindset persona. He said, 
when we're in a crunch, when we have a deadline and I'm not sure we're going to make it, Dwayne shows up. <laughs> and Dwayne makes me critical and mean and um, bossy. And then the other people in his unit said things like this. Yeah, and when your Wayne shows up, my Yanni comes roaring out. And my Yanni, macho male, makes me cower and grovel and do all the things that you hate, which makes your Dwayne furious. And they were talking about that. I thought it was fabulous. And that group used to have the lowest morale in the organization, and they shot way up. They're getting an award this year for the progress they've made. So name it, claim it, and talk about it. And over time, recruit it to work with you on your growth mindset goals. <clears throat> And here's part three of the journey. Now remember, in the good old days, we thought that once adults had a growth mindset, they could easily pass it on. But we have now been encountering over and over a very surprising finding. In our work and the work, recent work of others, we have found that there is very little relationship between a teacher or a parent's growth mindset and their student's or children's growth mindset. And we thought, oh my god, how is that possible? But, as with everything, <clears throat> we become determined to figure it out and we do the research and here's what we're finding. That in many cases, the educator's walk is not matching their talk. So in one beautiful study by Kathy Luson, she um, researched middle school math teachers. Many of them used the worth, words growth mindset in their classrooms, but their practice wasn't consistent with it. And what she found was that it was only when the teachers were teaching for understanding and were giving kids feedback in a way that grew their understanding and were giving them a chance to revise their work, to demonstrate their improved understanding, that's when they were passing on their growth mindset. It wasn't about having it live in your head or about saying the words. It was about walking the walk. <clears throat> Similarly, in the study by Yang and colleagues, they found that many math teachers, again math teachers, were professing a growth mindset but it's only when they sat with the kids who were stuck or confused and said, let's see what you're doing. Let's see what your understanding is. Let's see where we can go next. Those kids were developing more of a growth mindset. We're doing research with parents too and finding that some parents treat the child's setback or failure as though it's harmful for them. It's going to blow their confidence and interfere with their learning. So they either show their anxiety and concern, or they kind of go, oh, it's OK. You don't have to be good at everything. And where the child hears, you don't think I have the ability. But other parents think failure, setbacks, mistakes, those are helpful, and they treat them that way. They don't get super positive about it, super negative about it, anxious. It's more matter of fact. Oh, that's interesting. Let's talk about it. Let's see what we can do. Let's see where we can go from there. 
And those kids are developing a growth mindset. We recently published a study of parents' praise to their toddlers when they're actually they're babies and toddlers. We coded, <coughs> excuse me, um, parent-child interactions when from videotapes when the child was one, two, and three years of age. And they were coded for the kind of praise the mother was giving to the children. And we found that the more the mothers used process praise, which is praise for hard work, strategies, so trying many things, getting help, um, the, more, the greater proportion of that praise, the mother's praise, was focused on the child's process. The more the child had a growth mindset and a higher desire for challenge, five years later, when the child was in second grade, and we just found the more they were achieving in math and language areas two years after that when they were in fourth grade. It can always be changed, but it's powerful. That process praise was teaching children their abilities can grow. It can always be changed, but it's powerful. And now I feel entitled to interfere in airports You'd be surprised how many people are telling their babies they're brilliant. And by the way, I have interfered in airports. <laughs> so let's recap the practices that create growth mindsets. Teaching for conceptual understanding so that kids feel that understanding growing. Sit with children and ask them to show them what you they've done, figure out how they're thinking and where they can go next. Treat setbacks as beneficial for learning. Focus on the child's process and tie it to learning. So not just praising effort strategies, but tying it to the child's actual learning and progress. And a few more pointers. Use the neuroscience. Kids tell us before they have the growth mindset workshop that effort and difficulty made them feel dumb. But now, when they're really stretching themselves, they can feel those neurons making new and stronger connections. Give them that gift of that image. With adolescence, let them author their own learning of a growth mindset. We have found in our research the worst thing we can do is say, well, we adults have found the answer and we'd like to help you. Um, even when we send out online in, uh, workshops, we say, look, we're developing these for kids in the future and we'd like your input. And that's true, we use their input to revise, that makes them feel ownership. We give them quotes from other teens who have gone through. We have them advise uh, future students on how to implement a growth mindset. So let it come from them. And we're also learning to link growth mindset to the child's larger goals. So, they don't want to grow their brains to do well on achievement tests. I mean, that's not the ultimate in life. And I, my fear is that with all the emphasis on grades and achievement test scores, that becomes their larger goal or getting into the next school. And yet every child has within them a wonderful contribution. And we have found that when we ask them to think about the contribution they would like to make, to their family, to their community, to society in the future. And we link that growth mindset, growing your brain, to making that contribution in the future. Kids are so much more motivated. So, 
A growth mindset is not a panacea, but it does empower kids and help them learn. So why don't we as educators take that journey to our growth mindset? Bring our walk into line with our talk so that our growth mindset becomes our students' growth mindset as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. That was incredibly uh, uh, relevant, I think, to all of us and all our work. Um, so I want to know, when, my father, when I would come home with a 99% or a 98% on a test, and he said, why didn't you get 100? <laughs> Did that foster my, mind, uh, my uh, growth mindset? I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking it certainly motivated me at some level, I guess. Um, so to remind us, Carol and her research, uh, and the, the folks she works with, have found that students' mindset, how they perceive their abilities, play a key role in their motivation and achievement. And that they've found that it, if, if we change students' mindset, we can boost their achievement. So in, in diving down a little bit, we're gonna, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to take uh, 10, 15 minutes to ask a few handful or more questions. And we'll try to get through, you know, move really quickly. And then we do have mic runners, Jason and Tracy, are going to be available. And I'd love to be able to get um, several questions in. So we may even tee up you know, a few mm -hmm. at a time so Carol can be responsive. So in diving down to get even maybe more concrete than you were able to already get, so what have you found to be uh, the influences that, um, for how a student perceives his mindset? Mm -hmm. So um, we talked a lot of, about the messages that the student is getting in the from the environment, the failure messages, the praise, the focus on, on, on understanding. But I'd also love to bring in the larger culture of the school that we've become very, very interested in. Um, and we are finding with all kinds of organizations, we haven't looked at schools yet, um, but all kinds of organizations, that when people in an organization think that the organization believes in developing abilities, they feel more empowered. They feel more committed. They take on more innovation and creativity. And whereas the people in the more fixed mindset organizations feel, oh, if something better comes along, I'm going to take that. There's a lot of, they report a lot of cheating and cutting corners, you know, because they want to get ahead in that smart, dumb, talent, non-talent. So we're really, really becoming committed to understanding what is the larger culture that allows teachers and students to feel, um, to feel safe, to feel that we're out for your development. We're not here to sort you into who can succeed and who can. What about their uh, students' peers? The peers are really important. And one of the most exciting things I hear from people is that when it's a culture of development, the peers band together and do things. And uh, I've heard about skits and um, song, rap songs about growth mindset. It's kind of like they can really band together around learning. I haven't heard so much that they band together around standardized testing. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's good. Um, so I was thinking about when you were talking, you were talking about measuring um, a person's, whether yeah. a student or a grown-up's mindset. What do those measure, how does, what does that look like? So um, we have these measures just for research purposes. We have a set of questions. Your intelligence, something very basic about you that you can't really change versus everyone, no matter who they are, can become a lot more intelligent. We just use those for research purposes. And we talked about how recently people are talking about accountability for some of these non-cognitive measures. We're not there. We're not there in terms of um, measurement because kids can, teachers know what's the right answer to check and kids can be taught what's the right answer to check. So we're not there in terms of measurement. And also, as you saw from my talk, we're not there yet in terms of teaching educators how to pass it on. That is our number one research focus now. Um, we want to create online materials for educators, how to introduce and implement a growth mindset with their classroom. But we're not there yet. And we don't want to see a mandate to teach growth mindset to kids um, that causes teachers to do it in a way that's not effective. So the new federal law that recently passed mm -hmm. will inc does include these non-cognitive, uh, not mm -hmm. you know, I don't even like any of the ways they're kind of clumped together. Are you getting inquiries already? Yes, many inquiries. And, and on the one hand, I'm thrilled that these factors are now understood to be a central part of education and are something are things that drive learning. That's key to me. The recognition that these are things that drive students learning. But we're not ready for that, or some areas might be, but we are not ready for that accountability. Uh, part. And I don't know that you and I talked about this uh, when we were thinking about the kinds of issues we wanted to cover off on the core district in mm -hmm. uh, California. Have mm -hmm. you worked with them? I, I have worked a little bit but, with them. Because they're trying to incorporate mm -hmm. some of these measures into other ways of... Yes. And, yes. and again, there may be some non-cognitive skills, more like skills, that are ready for that and some um, good assessments may have been developed for those skill things, but these more uh, mindsets, beliefs, patterns of behavior, um, we're not there yet. So Carol, you talked a bit about, and what I put on my notes here was this kind of perception versus reality, mm -hmm. your walk and talk, I think, yeah. uh, metaphor. Um, do you see it more in students or grown-ups or, you know, the difference? I have a growth mindset, but when you measure it, I really don't. Mm -hmm. and, and just what is the, how do you think about moving people who think they have a growth mindset to, but really don't to? Yes. Yeah. We see it more in the adults. The kids, the kids tell it like it is. Um, <laughs> But I don't blame the adults. Um, I feel like we may have communicated, or we may even have believed it was simple to achieve a growth mindset, or that you could achieve a growth mindset rather than embark on this more difficult lifelong journey. Um, but now we, we see, we are trying to spell out what are the steps of that journey. And I mentioned to you a minute ago, um, in my freshman seminar, I used to tell them, how are you moving toward a growth mindset? And a lot of them would say, oh, I've always had a growth mindset. And I'd look, what do you mean? I don't think that's true, but I didn't quite say it that way. Um, but now I give the assignment, what are your fixed mindset triggers? Name your fixed mindset persona and bring it on board with you. Tell me how you're gonna bring it on board. Everybody writes in gory detail about their fixed mindset triggers, their fixed mindset persona, you know, and they'll name it from their picky Aunt Ruth or their um, critical Uncle Henry. Or One student gave it his middle name because it is sort of part of him, but it's not the main part of him. And it's about moving more toward um, being able to 
stay in a growth mindset place more of the time and not letting that fixed mindset persona subvert you. And once that becomes the language of the school, people can joke about it and talk about it. Whoa, there I was, and um, this is what the student did, and um, Henrietta came roaring in, and this is, I, I caught her, but this is what she wanted to do, and this is what I did instead. So you told me about another assignment you've given your uh, students in the seminar. Oh, yeah. I give them an assignment to do something outrageously bold, italicized, exclamation point, growth mindset. Something outrageously growth mindset, something they never would have done otherwise, but that will help them change in an important way they want to change. So last year, um, one young man was outrageously, well, extremely shy. He realized the whole Stanford experience was passing him by. He sat in his dorm room while everyone else networked and joined clubs. And for the assignment, he decided to run for president of his dorm. <laughs> the night came for the campaign speeches. He was you know, kind of waiting in line. And he thought, I can still go sit down and not do this, but then what will I write for my paper? <laughs> so he got up there, he gave his speech, and he won. <laughs> he became the center of social life in his dorm. He then tried out for the freshman class play. He joined a salsa group that salsa all over the region. And he just went from there. I love that. Um, you've said that a growth mindset is not... So just one more please, thing. Please, please, please. You can all do that as a group in your schools and come back and report. It's really hilarious. <laughs> or not. <Yeah>. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, Carol, you've said that a growth mindset is not a, just about effort, and we were hearing quite a lot about that, that students need a repertoire of approaches. Yes. You again said that. Yeah. What are some of those approaches, though, and, and not just the what they're not, but how do you, um, you know, I want folks to be able to go home with, you know, at least a few very concrete yes. strategies or yes. tactics. Yes. So, um, thinking about different strategies. if. If students learn um, to think about what can I do to help myself here? What are some other things we can, I can try? We are finding in our research that that one question when you're stuck or when you're confronting something difficult, what can I do to help myself is really magical. What can I try? Did that work? Should I, should I stick to that strategy? Should I try something else? Just knowing that they've tried a few things so that even when you sit down with them to say, let's see what you've done, let's figure it out, and you say, what have you tried? Maybe it's good to have them have tried a few things that they can tell you about. So that's really important. And then in our society, there's often a stigma about asking for help. But we need to teach kids and teachers how to ask for help at the right time, not right away, after they've tried some things, when they're truly stuck, and also not just asking for the answer, but asking for input that will help them know where to go next. You know, you started, or you um, actually were answering something that I'm interested in. When you think about a deficit model, where everybody has, or people can say, here's why a student can't learn. Everything's mm -hmm. always, or often couched in the negative versus an asset way of looking at yes. it, right? Yes. And so, why do you think people default that way? Is it easier? Oh, wow. You know, my heart is still broken from hearing um, that some educators are saying, that child can't learn, he has a fixed mindset, or um, uh, think, things like that, or yelling at the class. Look at the chart in the front. You don't have a fixed mindset. What's, you don't have a growth mindset. What's wrong with you? So it's like, hello. <laughs> 
you think that's protective? Yes, I think it's protective. And we used to say the kids didn't have the ability. Now we're saying they don't have the mindset. Um, I think it's protective. It's sort of like, it's not my fault the child isn't learning. They've had bad teaching in the past. They have, uh, they come from a certain background. There's always this way of absolving yourself. And maybe it isn't all your fault, but now you have this incredible opportunity to open up a human being to learning. So you don't want excuses for why that child can't learn. You want to try everything in your power to open them up to that learning. So I had wondered about the relationship of your work to the to efforts to improve school climate and culture. Mm -hmm. You've addressed that. Um, um, at least, you know, to some yeah. degree. But I'm also interested in the relationship of your work to uh, the big push now for social emotional learning mm -hmm. kinds of tactics. Yes. Do you see a crosswalk there? Uh, I think social emotional learning is similar and different. Um, my work, Mindsets, is um, focused on the, on attitudes, beliefs that help kids learn. Social emotional learning is bigger than that. Some of those are wonderful attributes, kindness, cooperation. Um, so those are wonderful. The school is a wonderful place to teach kids those values. I see it as a little bit separate. Yeah. Yeah. Here's, so we're going to take questions. So I hope you all have been thinking. And the mic runners, Jason's there, I see Tracy's there. So I, and you know what, let's stand. Let's stand. Um, it's kinetic for us, and I want you all to be able to see Carol. So let me see some uh, hands for people who have questions, Brian. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do like two. So I'm going to put Jason on one and then Tracy on one. So you've got here, say who you are and where you, you know, your district or who you were with, and Hi. to Carol. I'm Linda Rue, and I'm from Williamsville, New York, um, outside of Buffalo. And your work has been life-changing for me. I want to start by saying that. But I wanted to ask you specifically, you talked about some of the things that we can praise our kids, including our, my toddler grandchildren, <laughs> like <laughs> um, hard work, applying strategies, asking for help. Could you talk a little bit about the role of reflection as mm. one of those things that supports a growth mindset? Yes. That's great. Carol, just a second, because I, I think it'll go faster. We'll get more in. Tracy, you've got a question? Oh, let me answer. Because go ahead. Go ahead. By the time I finish my okay. answer, I don't remember what the okay. second question is. I get so involved in my answer. Um, so reflection is a wonderful thing where you reflect on a problem, you reflect on what you've tried, you reflect on, its, on the efficacy of the strategy you tried, you think about when is it time to get help. So reflection is good. Reflection in a fixed mindset can go awry. I didn't get this, it's hard, maybe I'm not smart, what does this mean about me, blah, 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 blah. All the rumination that we know leads to depression or you know, discouragement. So the kind of metacognitive reflection where you reflect on your strategies and their efficacy or what resources might be helpful, that's a great kind of reflection. Great, thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Jeanette Moore, and I own a tutoring company in New York, and I also teach at Western Connecticut State University. And I had a question in regard to your research. Is there any current research that is studying um, the role of mindset development with professors and students? Yes. Um, so that bridge between senior year and freshman year of college. Hmm. OK, yes. Yeah, so um, one of my former students, Mary Murphy, is studying um, college students and finding uh, that some students, especially in STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math, and finding that uh, many students believe that their professors think only some kids can learn and do well 
in those subjects. And they actually say that in many. Um, they're sitting in classes and, and writing down what professors say. Some of them say, if it's not easy for you, you don't belong here. Or half of you will be gone in, in a week or two, and that's as it should be. Um, but, other, but other students perceive their professors to say, anyone can learn this. And their professors say things like, everyone in this room can learn, and we are here to make sure that happens. We will sit with you as long as you need until you understand this material. And the finding is that women and underrepresented minorities blossom when they perceive that their professor in STEM fields has this growth mindset perspective. That's great. Brian, you had a question. You've got yes. it. Yes. Um, good afternoon, Dr. Duck. My name is Brian Pick. I work for DC Public Schools. I love my job, but boy, right now I wish you were a freshman in Stanford University. <laughs> um, there's a lot of buzz right now in education circles about concepts like grit, perseverance, mm -hmm. productive struggle. I would uh, be curious to hear your thought on how growth mindset is or isn't kind of those concepts yes. as well. Yes. Thank you for that question. Um, there's research showing that um, growth mindset is a basis for grit. Um, so the two together could make a nice combination because how do you teach grit? Um, and we don't want to think it's some, something some people have and some don't, and so some will succeed and some won't. But if we understand that there are beliefs and mindsets that are at the basis of grit, then we can begin to understand how to teach those qualities, those patterns of behavior to more kids. Brian, did you include resilience in that? Resilience. Yeah. Well, bouncing back from setbacks is at the heart of growth mindset. Um, Tracy, Marty. Hi. Hi, Marty Blank with the Institute for Educational Leadership. Can you talk about growth mindset through the lens of racial equity? Yes. And to what extent you were, your last comment to this questioner here it suggested, reminded me that we have a, continue to have a predominantly white teacher workforce yes. working with an increasingly minority student population. Yes. Are there a set of assumptions and stereotypes that yes. fuel whether children are fixed or growth in their mindset? Yeah, and whether teachers view them through a, a fixed or growth lens. So we're finding that um, our growth mindset workshops have an even more beneficial effect for students who are members of underrepresented groups. Um, we're finding, as I said, the, the teachers who are walking the growth mindset walk are having a disproportionate um, Li positive effect on s students who are un uh, underrepresented in those fields. We're totally committed to, equ to issue issues of equity and to studying um, how, how to close those achievement gaps. In other research, Ours and others, we found that when students learn a growth mindset and then go into a stereotyped or threatening situation, they're not as affected by those negative stereotypes because they're thinking, it's not fixed. It's a matter of learning, developing these skills. I can do that. And they also understand that when they get the growth mindset message, the person delivering the message is looking at them through a growth mindset lens, not through the lens of a stereotype about ability. So, Kay. yeah. All right. I'll stop no, there. Please. No, please. Jason, there. do you have a question? Right. Hand up. Michael? Oh, we got one, but sorry. You're now in the queue. I'm in the field of English language learner education. 
And we have three decades of research indicating the failure of teacher preparation programs to overcome that deficit perspective on the part of teachers toward English language learners and other culturally and linguistically diverse learners. Based on your research, what recommendations would you have? What would be your vision for uh, teacher preparation programs to transform that? Mm -hmm. Since after three decades, nobody that uh, I know of has been successful in it. So it's really interesting because in the developmental psychology literature, bilingualism is a huge advantage. Um, uh, kids have more um, a stronger executive function if they're um, able to work in two languages, etc. I think one important thing would be to teach in teacher preparation programs that bilingualism confers cognitive advantages. I think that would go a long way. But then also to have them generate ways in which um, coming from a different culture, having a different linguistic background could be an asset that the child brings rather than a deficit. So I think that kind of discussion and orientation in itself would be very valuable. Michael, would you like to follow on that? You were going to ask a question? Uh, yes. Yeah, here comes Jason. He's on the run. <laughs> Superintendent Matsuda. Thank you. Um, yes, Mike Matsuda from Anaheim Newton High School District. So one of the leaders that, to learn from that, we've, that I've learned from uh, Steve Sandoval from uh, Colorado is from a district that has competency-based and mastery-based learning. Mm -hmm. It seems to me a natural fit, but would you comment on that? Oh, yeah. I think mastery-based learning is a, as a, as a wonderful fit with growth mindset, um, especially if students are reminded of their progress. Um, so, you know, when you're confused, you feel like, oh, I'm back to square one. Even my graduate students feel that way. And you lose sight of all the way you've come, the distance you've traversed. So mastery learning with um, emphasis on progress, with showing students how their good work habits, if, if they've done those good work habits, have fostered the learning, the strategies they've tried, the resources they've used, very, very compatible. You know, it strikes me, Carol, that in business and in other sectors, the notion of failing is actually celebrated. In some quarters, yes. In, in well, Silicon you fail Valley. fast to iterate yes, and move on, exactly. Right? Silicon Valley, yep. absolutely. Well, I mean, it strikes me yeah. that some of it is a, about the iterative yes. process, yes, right? Yes, exactly. All right, we have time for one more question. Jason's got one. Hi. I'm Mary Kay Carlo with Scholastic. How are you? Fine. So I thought about what you said today. And a professor at my daughter's college also is a professor at Harvard. And he made the comment that at their particular school in the STEM program, they really do try to weed the kids out. Where at the Harvard, when he teaches at Harvard, there's this um, culture that we want to keep the students. We don't want to lose anybody. Mm -hmm. Once they're there, they want to keep them. So yeah. completely different culture. But what about this idea of this, that students are able to collaborate a lot at Harvard? That's good. And so do you think? Collaboration is wonderful. You know, in real life, <laughs> You collaborate. In real life, my research wouldn't be what it is if I didn't talk all day with my colleagues and design studies and everyone runs out and does their part. Real life is about collaboration. It's about knowing how to put your minds together to create something um, greater. It has to be orchestrated well. But rarely in, in, in real life do you sit down at your desk uh, just 
well, maybe, maybe it's not so rare, but it shouldn't be that you sit down, learn, take a test. Everyone around you is doing the same thing, but no one talks about it. It, it should be collaborative. I'd like you all to join me. I, first of all, I want you to know I've named my fixed mindset self. <laughs> and for reasons I will not divulge, it is Chip. Ooh. Ooh, there's deep meaning there. Let's all thank Carol for her time and message. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Carol. Thank you.